Let's go back to neural networks. The question is that uh, why do we want to use neural networks instead of the uh, classical piecewise linear functions or radio fun basis functions uh, to approximate uh, unknown functions? The reason is that neural networks are promising to outperform the traditional uh, piecewise linear functions or radio basis functions in some aspects. Uh, in this slide, I demonstrate the so-called curse of dimensionalities. Uh, let's consider a piecewise linear functions. In 1D, we divide the intervals into n uh, intervals. And for this n intervals, uh, if we want to construct a piecewise linear functions, uh, we uh, usually uh, assign one base basis functions to each node in this 1D interval. So approximately, we have n plus 1 piecewise linear function basis in 1D. And in 2D, you, are, you, you do the same thing for each dimension, and you have an order n squared uh, piecewise linear function basis in 2D. And in 3D, you have n cubed. And in D dimension, though, you have, a two, you have a n to the dth power, which grows exponentially in the dimension D. This is not good. Uh, your computational cost can uh, be very huge for high dimensional cases. But for neural networks, if you have a high dimensional out input and a high dimensional output, it, it is easy to program that. And also, uh, it is uh, empirically demonstrated that in many uh, tasks where you have a high dimensional input or high dimensional output, the neural networks can perform quite well. And another property of the neural networks is that they seem to perform very well to approximate discontinuities in functions. For example, uh, here I demonstrate approximating a jump function using uh, neural networks, piecewise linear functions, and radio basis functions. The function is shown here. It's just a 1D function where the input is x and the output is y. And in the first, uh, in the first image, I show neural networks. And the orange dot and the orange triangles are the data set. Uh, well, I use them to train the neural networks. So that's data pairs, and the, the, uh, it's x, y pairs. And so if you have input x and output y, you can train a neural network. And we can see that the neural network cap, uh, captured the jump very well, uh, and it does not oscillate a lot. But if I use the same uh, data set to train the piecewise linear functions or radio basis functions, basically it's not training those uh, piecewise linear functions or well, radio basis functions is actually solving a linear system to extract the coefficients of the um, basis functions. And the, you can see that in piecewise linear functions or well, radio basis functions, the solutions oscillate a lot uh, if you have inappropriate, uh, inappropriate uh, number of loads. Uh, the 40 and 20 and the 10 represents the number of basis functions you use. And in this aspect, the neural networks seem to be uh, very uh, good. And actually, in many scientific computing problems, the unknown functions may exhibit some jump. And those can be very challenging for the traditional um, methods, such as using piecewise linear functions. But this seems to be uh, very good for uh, neural networks. And let's also consider uh, about the robustness to noise. Here I have a 2D image, and it's actually a 2D function, uh, which, takes x and, uh, which takes x and y and outputs uh, another value, the, the value for each x, y pair. And I add uh, some noise to the data set, and uh, maybe 10% or 5%. And then I use the data as I sample a lot of data on the surface uh, with noise, and and I use them to train the neural network or the radio basis functions, of course, uh, and also train uh, the piecewise linear functions. And this is a demonstration, and you can see that for neural networks, it does not exhibit those kind of oscillatory uh, uh, surfaces on uh, near the uh, boundary. But for radio basis functions, it is known. It is actually known that the radio basis functions is very susceptible to the noise, and yeah. And in this scenario, the neural networks uh, seems to be very robust to noise. 
Also, let's consider something different uh, from uh, the deep learning aspect. For deep learning, uh, you only have a lot of data, and the data is so huge that they cannot fit into memory. But for inverse modeling problems, for many inverse modeling problems in scientific computing, you only have very small data sets, and you can fit all the data sets into your memory. So in this case, we can uh, use the so-called quasi-Newton optimization, which is the uh, very powerful optimization technique traditionally used in scientific computing. And, and if you use this kind of a technique to do the same thing, uh, and I think this uh, this loss function that the errors are the same uh, are, are, are for the same case as here, and I I use the quasi Newton optimization which is BFGS optimizer and also stochastic gradient descent optimizer to train the two uh, the, the two scenarios and then you can see that the training uh, the this this set is the BFGS and this set is the stochastic gradient descent. You can see that the BFGS outperforms the stochastic gradient descent uh, a lot, and you can see different scales. This is ten to the thir uh, three, uh, and this is ten to the uh, ten to the negative two, and you also see a lot of oscillatory uh, uh, behavior for stochastic gradient uh, method, uh, stochastic gradient descent method. And this also tells us something about uh, the, the the difference between deep learning techniques for like a computer vision or natural language processing and those for scientific computing. In scientific computing, you only have very small data set and you do not have a lot of noise in your data set, and you only have a very steep problems because they are governed by some steep uh, PDEs and or uh, yeah, all well, the problems themselves are quite stiff. So in this scenario, you would rather want fast convergence, and you you can afford the memories, and you can afford the computational cost, and the quasi-Newton optimization may be favorable in some scenarios. Now we talk about the several aspects of neural networks, and let us summary a little bit. The first uh, take-home message is that a neural network is very easily extended to high dimensions. Uh, yeah, as you have already programmed some neural networks, you can see how it is uh, how easy it is to go from two dimensional to three dimensional, even to one hundred dimensional inputs or outputs. And the second thing is that the neural networks exhibits adaptively for discontinuities functions. And this is very important um, for inverse problems because you never know well the discontinuity is so uh, if you are using going to use like piecewise linear functions or radius basis functions that are not robust to these discontinuities, you will have trouble. And the third uh, take home message is that neural networks is more robust to noise than uh, many traditional global basis functions such as radio basis functions. And yeah, as we already demonstrated, the radio basis functions exhibit some alternatory behaviors near the boundaries. And the fourth message is the is that uh, for scientific computing inverse problems where you have small data set and you do not have too much noise in your data set, you can use the so-called quasi-Newton method or quasi-second order optimizers, which is more expensive but converge much faster than stochastic gradient descent methods. Okay. So finally, let's go back to the inverse problems, the function inverse problems, where you have unknown functions kappa x, and and then you can just substitute your kappa x using a function approximator. And in this lecture, we focus on using neural networks kappa theta, and then you solve the PD consider optimization problem. However, this poses new challenges here. Theta can be very high dimensional because of neural networks. You only over parameterize your neural network. You have a lot of uh, weights and biases, and in typical inverse problems, uh, like the first case we say, we only have two parameters to optimize. But here you might have millions or yeah or even more. And the second difficulty is that uh, traditionally, if you want to solve this kind of 
uh, parameter inverse problem, you can calculate the gradient with uh, of this loss function, objective function with respect to theta uh, based on this constraint. And you can use like so the so-called uh, adjoint state method or many other approaches like automatic depreciation to do that. However, if we have uh, if we have theta as uh, the, the theta as the weights and the biases in the neural network, that means it can be very hard to do that by hand. Like you deriving the gradient with respect to theta by hand, and and this is one challenge. Another challenge is that even if you can use automatic differentiation as we already show in the parameter inverse problems, uh, in some in, in many cases the, the numerical PDs are very stiff. So you would want to use uh, some uh, special servers, and also you for stability you want to use like implicit servers, and that that's not very obvious for doing a, uh, automatic differentiation. And those are the new challenges arising out of uh, this kind of approximating techniques. And in the next few lectures, we will talk about techniques to train the neural networks within a PD system.